animators and artists. To celebrate Toon Boom Animation's 30th anniversary, we're hosting virtual studio tours with studios that make exceptional use of Harmony and Storyboard Pro. And today, joining us for the studio tour are Christian Barkel, uh, Meg Strawn, and Debbie Steer from Flying Bark Productions. Flying Bark Productions is an animation studio with more than 350 artists across Sydney and LA locations. The studio is known for its reputation for high-end traditional 2D and CGI animation on productions that include Marvel's Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, Lego Monkey Kid, and Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Flying Bark prides themselves on having a balance of IP and service work, making an attractive place to work on not only for uh, improving your skill set, but also artistically as well. So Christian, Meg, and Debbie, welcome to the live stream. Thank you. Thank you for having us. us. Yeah, hi. So let's uh, start with an icebreaker. Uh, what is your role at Flying Bark Productions, and what does a typical day in your role look like? And we'll start with Christian. Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm Christian. My name's uh, Christian. I'm the head of, of 2D Animation. Um, so my job is supervising and, and directing a lot of our 2D projects, um, Rise of the Team and T, Monkey Kid, uh, Glitch Checks, um, but yeah, as a, a supervisor and director, I spend all day looking at everybody else's beautiful work and being jealous that I'm not drawing um, while telling them what to draw. <laughs> And, uh, and Meg, yeah, can Meg, tell us a little bit about your role at Flying Bark and what does a typical day look like for you? Um, I'm a 2D animator, one of the animators that I get to send my work off to Chris for him to review. Um, I pretty much sit at my computer from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and draw continuously on Toon Boom. <laughs> and uh, Debbie, what is your role at Flying Bark and what does a typical day look like in your role? I'm the head of animation production at Flying Bark, so I look after multiple projects in the company, um, and my job is really varied where I, I'm looking at projects really early on. Um, and if it's an IP project, I'm looking at it from development, and if it's a service job, I'm looking at the sort of materials that they've sent, and uh, from there I create budgets and uh, planning with my producers, and we uh, once it's greenlit, we will hire the key crew, and then from then on, I'll be looking after the project in a more sort of uh, top level with the clients or our uh, production partners, and I also do a lot of um, work with uh, the facility staff at uh, flying bark as well like sort of communicating the the project uh lifespan the number of artists and the kind of equipment we need to it uh r d pipeline and the hr and recruitment and debbie how would you describe flying bark productions and the type of animations that your, your studio specializes in we are a uh, we we have a bit of a unique place in the animation uh, sphere. We we only deal with animation uh, productions. We don't do any visual effects or uh, commercials, um, and we have a bit of a unique uh, position because we we deal both with our own IP and we also deal with service work for um, streamers and studios, and um, so. Like we deal with both CG uh, animation, 2D animation, and hybrid uh, animation as well, the 2.5D as we call it. And Christian, do you have anything to add about like the way that um, Flying Bark Productions, uh, the sort of productions that they specialize in and that uh, your team works on? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we're, I think we're known for a pretty wild variety of styles um, between all our, our 2D and CG productions. But um, uh, in the 2D, we've definitely got a little bit of a house style that's um, pretty high energy, poppy. It's kind of a, a Western um, to anime hybrid um, a lot of the time. And it's it's, uh, it's a lot of action comedy as well. So it's it's really big, goofy, over the top uh, characters and, and then really ridiculous, um, climactic, exciting action set pieces as well. Yeah, he's hit the nail on the head, like movement and style and just fun feel and energetic, I think is where we thrive in the most. Yes. And Meg, is there anything else that you want to add about the uh, the style that Flying Bark Production specializes in? Yeah, um, it's just, I feel like um, making something fun and interesting uh, visually is what we strive to do and what we enjoy doing. It's what I enjoy doing anyway. Yes. Uh, Meg, how would you describe your journey to your current role at Flying Bark Productions? 
Um, I had a bit of a odd way to join. Um, Flying Barker did uh, participated in a two week study with Tate and Moore, which I had the opportunity to join in um, after I did my bachelor in 3D animation. Um, so I did that to those two weeks, um, and at the end of it, I was hired straight out of that, straight into Lego Monkey Kid, which was an excellent first job for me. <laughs> Lego Monkey Kids is a really interesting series because all of the characters have these like sea snap hands, uh, but you sort of need to find ways of like making them uh, like, beatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I actually spent so long just drawing claw hands that I forgot how to do fingers. Um, <laughs> but uh, I still, I feel like I still do that in my own work. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll just draw it like <laughs> no fingers. Um, but no, it was yeah. a great job to go straight into um, really fun, great team. Everyone loved yeah. it. <laughs> I feel like it's, um, I, don't, I don't know if this happened to you, Meg, but I, I feel like it's everyone started on, on Monkey Kid drawing real hands to figure <laughs> out the pose and yeah. then they draw like a, like a Lego glove over it. Yeah. And now it's like the inverse where now, yeah, we'll draw something that's like more anatomically correct and you draw like your constructions. Yeah. Like My a constructions little the Lego hands. Hand. Yeah, and then you add the fingers. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really uh, it's a bit of a curse, but it's fun at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that was you know that whole shows um, uh, was, was really good training for everybody drawing wise, except for the hands, like the hardest thing to draw, <laughs> and we and we deprived uh, yeah. so many people of it for for years on that project. So. I mean, I, I know this is a tangent, but it, it's it's such an interesting production to me because you have those characters um where like they're based off these like plastic figures right like you have a very solid volume to work from uh but the animation is so dynamic and so expressive uh, it's just kind of amazing to see like how you interpreted those characters yeah it was a little bit of a journey finding that as well i think a lot of um uh a lot of trial and error i think in the especially in the first season um that yeah. i with the that job. whole the jump from season one to season two was like I felt like there was a huge jump in between the way everyone really figured out how to move these characters in a more organic way for something that is so rigid. Like comparing it to um, Ninjago or something, I feel like with 2D we had the flexibility to make them feel more organic and I um, that's one of my favourite things about getting to work on it. Yeah, yeah. There was It, was, it took a while to get kind of a, a set of, uh, rules and a structure to it, which I, it probably sounds like um, anyone who's a fan of the show is probably like there's rules. Um, but the you know starting that was was very like Legos obviously used to a lot of CG productions for that where the minifig is is portrayed very faithfully to the the actual designs and um, we kind of went into that production with Lego and uh, in a really interesting way in that they wanted us to do something fresh and new and they'd seen our work on Rise of the Team and we were like basically like, can you do that for us um and we're like put us out of our comfort zone and get crazy and weird um which I think they almost uh, immediately regretted uh, <laughs> they were like I think a few a few times they sent their like 100 page minifig design bible at us and we're like this is all the the proportions and it's all exactly this and, and stuff but after a while I think they kind of uh they they, the, the more they saw the characters and the more they, they saw them in context and moving and saw how exciting and how funny it could be when it, it had that kind of looseness and, and that dynamic energy, um, they, they ended up being uh, really, really, those, those same people who were who were so uncomfortable at the start ended up being some of the biggest champions of the show, which was, was really great to see. Yeah, I think there has to be a lot of trust there. Um, Debbie, I wanted to ask you, how do you describe your journey to your current role at Flying Bark Productions? Um, yeah, I actually started as an animator uh, originally, originally, um, but um, I felt it was uh, more for like a, it was a medical imaging company. <laughs> um, and I've, I felt very trapped in that role. So I kind of went back to study and uh, learned uh, what I really wanted to get into live action. And so I did that for a while and then um, when an opportunity arose in Australia, because I'm originally from the UK to work uh, um, at Animal Logic in Australia, I jumped at the chance and moved here um, 15 years ago. And um, yeah, um, basically worked my way up at Animal Logic. And then uh, at a certain point, um, 
I met up with people at Flying Bark and I really loved the project that they were pitching to me. So I moved over to Flying Bark and have been there ever since. Do you feel that in your role having an art background was, was really helpful? Uh, I've been told it's been very useful because uh, I was a... I actually, when I did go to study uh, a university, I actually just stuck to animation in the end. I, I was just enjoying it too much and I did all uh, styles. I mean, I don't look at my reel because it's awful, but um, <laughs> I think I showed you, Christian, my stop motion animation. I've never seen <laughs> I that. I liked it. I liked, you it. liked it. It was funny. Um, and um, so I did stop motion 2D and CG animation whilst at uni. And uh, so I never actually got rid of the bug and went into live action in the end uh, in, in any heavy kind of handed way. Um, but, um, sorry, what was the question <laughs> I wanted to? I was just wondering, like, because I, I think it's really cool when there are people who are on, like, the business side in the studio yeah. who understand oh, yeah, also the craft. Yeah, so, um, basically, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's been highlighted that, you know, I, I have a bit of a, uh, I ended up, um, even at Animalogic working a lot with the more technical teams because I understood CG enough to understand, like, what was happening uh, behind the image. Um, so in terms of the, even the terminology, um, et cetera. And so it really gave me quite uh, a bit of an insight into what the artists were going through and what their challenges were, rather than just knowing that their deadline was coming up, I could understand why they were having issues or, um, you know, you know, what I could anticipate to help them get their task done. So it really did help a lot. And I think in terms of, uh, understanding how long things take, I think really helped me kind of, um, make more, um, you know, uh, educated guesses and planning. So yeah, it really did actually help. And it's something that I have looked at before in, in my uh, production crew, a lot of my production staff studied animation. And, uh, Christian, how would you describe your journey to your current role at Flying Bar Productions? Um, my, journey was, uh, it, it was kind of interesting. At the time when um, I joined, and this was, uh, Debbie had worked at Flying Buck earlier, but I, I think had disappeared for a while, and then uh, had returned because it was uh, the first 2D animated show that was going to be produced at Flying Buck in years, um, and they had uh, absolutely nobody to work on it. Um, so so we joined and, and basically created the, uh, the 2D department as it is now at Flying Buck about um, seven or eight years ago. Um, at the time that was, uh, it was a 2D live action hybrid show, which is super interesting. And we were doing these like kind of animated cutaways. Um, and it was very kind of wild west, like scrappy. Um, I, I think originally as well, we just joined as, um, me and, and, uh, my brother actually, Tom Barkel and, uh, Sarah Harper, who's the 2D creative director for the company now as well had joined uh, as like three designers and storyboarders to produce all the pre-production for these animated cutaways and then send them uh, overseas to another company to animate. Um, and I think we got like an initial animation test or, or something from that. And we we're like, we, we have friends who could do that better. And, um, and, and we're like, we'd been at flying buff for like a couple of weeks and we're like, can we hire all our, all our friends from our previous jobs that, that are really talented and uh actually really quickly we're like yeah sure <laughs> there was like immediately quite a lot of trust i think which was was really great probably helped that it was a small project but um that that really gave us the opportunity to immediately show you know everything we had and um and from there uh we, we you know very quickly and weirdly as well got got the opportunity to work on rise of the team and t which we kind of expanded our team uh probably like four or five times over like a couple weeks um and and from then it's been a little smoother and more consistent and more professional uh but it was it was like a weird first uh year or so um yeah but um like uh meg was saying before as well i think uh yeah i think most people from who have joined fine bark at least on the 2d side have pretty unique little stories as well about how they got in with, with networking or through different kind of um yeah internships or traineeships or, or relationships with, with universities or just um through having really remarkable online profiles or having a friend of a friend of a friend as well so it's it's all pretty um 
Uh, yeah, every, everybody's kind of kind of come from a, a different place. Which I is, think there was about four or five others from that little TAFE cohort yeah. that um, ended up getting internships that then got a job and that's that are now working with us. And so it's nice to have familiar faces from that. Like we all started at the exact same time doing the exact same thing. And it's, um, it's really nice to see us all. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, so, Christian, from your point of view, how has the animation industry changed since you joined, both in terms of the business and uh, the art? Yeah, so um, I'll let Debs talk about the business because I'm too dumb there. But um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say I think like when when I was originally, you know, when I finished school and stuff, I I didn't um, really see a huge potential for animation jobs in Australia. Um, I think it just felt like a little bit of a pipe dream. Uh, so I actually opted not to study animation, even though I was really deeply passionate about it as a teenager. And I went into um, uh, fine arts and I was studying to be like a painter, traditional painter. Um, I, I I met through, through a, a random old friend of a friend. They um, threw like an animation internship to me at a, at a prior studio and um, and even that opportunity, even though it was really exciting at the time, I still didn't want to put my eggs in one basket because I just couldn't see like a lot of really exciting work being done. The kind of work that I wanted to do, which was really the, the work that um, has been produced a lot more in Australia now, which is inspired by all like kind of the, the Western and, and anime uh, shows that we, we all watched as teenagers, kind of uh, my generation. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so I, I really, I never thought we would, we would kind of get the kind of work like Rise of the Tim and in Australia. And I think um, I was kind of winging it the entire time going, I hope this works out and maybe one day I'm going to move overseas or, you know, to, to America or anywhere else to try to work on the kind of shows I, I want to. And so I think over the last, um, you know, 10 or 11 years that I've, I've been in the industry, I think seeing kind of more and more of those opportunities show up for artists and, and people being able to work on the shows that they're really passionate on here has been really exciting. Um, but I not to say anything of the business side of that, uh, but if, if you wanted to expand I, on that, Deb, so, oh, sorry, Meg. As well. So I did the exact same thing. I started in fine arts and I was like, I didn't, I didn't think that the industry in Australia would be where it's at now when I first started studying. Um, and I was kind of pushed by a friend to change, um, paths to go to animation they're like no it's it's coming up it's happening and i was like okay i'm trusting you <laughs> um yeah same thing yeah and i mean and it is tricky i think with that there's a, still even though there's much more of an industry for animation than um when i was studying I, there's it, there's an ebb and a flow to it as well and, and i think you know even even every second year there could be like way less productions in australia than than the, the early or the subsequent year or something as well. That can be really difficult for people like graduating as well because everyone knows you can try to capitalize really quickly on your first year out of university. But um, yeah, it's there's a ton of luck even within a single year of, of when you're looking for work and stuff. But um, yeah, but Deb can probably give a better answer about that. <laughs> Um, well, um, basically, I think, um, you know, since we, uh, well, I, I had a small stint at Flying Bark in, on a CG show and I went away just because it, at the time Flying Bark did ebb and flow with production. So I went away for a year and then when I came back, um, I was asked to produce the show with Christian, um, which was a hybrid live action 2D and CG. And the 2D component was actually the smallest component. I was off in a, in a shoot in Canada and then coming, like just messaging them, asking how things were going. And um, yeah, like I, I really, you know, we, we did see some talent there and I was, we were racking our brains on what we we're going to do after the show ended and how we were going to move forward. And like TMNT, like Rise of the TMNT landed on our, our laps, literally, it was all very serendip serendipity, like it just all happened all at the exact moment in time where we needed it to happen. And we sent off a test and like Nickelodeon was scratching their heads going, who, who are these people and how, and the producer was very, very oddly contacted us because we weren't known for 2D at all. We were known for 2D years and years previously and he had just happened to have a chat with another service studio who said, try Flying Bark and it all happened magically. And then we were suddenly left with this mammoth task of crewing up for an entire show. And um, we learned a lot from that. And um, like we actually pretty much grew our own team 
uh, so that the industry in, in, in Australia is quite small. There, there are a, a, a few small boutique studios for, for 2D animation or some studios take on 2D animation, but it's very much they bring in a couple of freelancers do the work and that's the end of that. So that's why there wasn't any consistent work. But due to having series work, which obviously, you know, like it's, it's appealing to animators in two ways. Number one, they, they get consistent long-term work instead of small freelance jobs and secondly they uh get to just work uh, you know work on their craft consistently and improve themselves so because of rise of the tmnt we managed to really kind of expand our core team into a much bigger core team who could teach more and more and then we kind of it's you know uh kind of snowballed from there so we you know from that moment which was what seven years ago christian um you know, we've, we've grown our own sort of pool of animators and we do our own thing really that's uh, kind of our own unique way of animating. So in terms of the industry, I think we've just grown our own little <laughs> swimming pool now, I guess. <laughs> How many have we got? <laughs> um, yeah. A little pool to a yeah. big pool. Yeah, there's, there's some really, really awesome studios in Australia growing at the same time. Yes. I think we were... Um, we yeah, I, I think we we got uh, I get very lucky with with some of those early shows, so we kind of um, yeah skyrocketed in numbers, which was really exciting. But uh, there's yeah a lot of other two D studios that we're very big fans of, and I, I think we share um, artists with as well. We're doing productions as well, places yeah. like Studio think, Show Off uh, and Half Giant and stuff. We're we're very yeah. big fans of of the teams over there. Yeah, and I think the other big moment for us as well was the affordability of our um, our productions because at the time. Um, there was a like you know there are tax offsets that you kind of re you rely on to create this work in the in your uh, you know sort of regions, and our particular state uh, introduced the ten percent offset I think on Rise of the TMNT two, um, and that kind of meant that we would became a lot more affordable and a lot more competitive for studios to invest in us and um, pretty much how we uh, got Lego uh, Monkey Kid was through that so um yeah it, it very much uh, meant that we were, we were at a price point that was a lot more appealing as well so that helped a lot yeah uh one thing sort of the threads that i've noticed is um christian you've mentioned <coughs> that like anime was uh, an influence on you growing up um from your point of view like how has anime influenced your art um honestly i think just growing up it was like the coolest looking thing that I'd ever seen. Um, <laughs> I think I kind of went from like '90s comic books, like um, like Jim Lee kind of stuff. Um, honestly, massive Rob Liefeld uh, fan as a child. I had a ton of X Force and stuff. So I think I was just trying to look for like the coolest, edgiest thing you could find. And then I think as a kid, Lots like that, and of, like, yeah, exactly. Pouches everywhere. Super, super helpful. For combat um but yeah there's there was kind of like that was like the coolest thing i'd seen and then i think you catch these little glimpses on like late night tv of like ads or like the, the ads at the start of like a vhs or something for like ghost in the shell or like a hero or something and you just go that's like the coolest thing ever so i think that was honestly like the the biggest appeal there but i think then having watched more and more over time I, I think you know the the cool edgy stuff is one thing as, as a teenager but seeing like just how much energy and and how much fun kind of works like um fully coolly can be or uh, kill a kill anything from trigger and stuff i think was just mm. really fun pool in that it was like and and there's kind of like a a weird thing when you watch animes like that because it's it's not it's kind of inconsistent it's loose and it's wild and as a fan of art as well, like fine arts and stuff. And, and I was studying uh, a lot of abstract painting and stuff at the time. There's kind of like a looseness there that was, um, that I kind of went, ah, oh, that's, you know, you can just be so expressive with animation there. And you can you can tell this these stories in, in a way that we could, you could just never really capture that feel in, in any other format, I don't think. Um, and I, I think that was a really big draw for me, but I think people probably have similar experiences at the studio we kind of cultivated a lot of like-minded people and i'd love to hear what meg's kind of experience <laughs> with anime and stuff is but i i think when we join um when people join the studio 
I, a lot of those first months is, is is just going oh do you guys like this yeah do you guys like that yeah yeah and we, we're fine we're all fans of the same stuff and i think the work from the studio kind of drew in people who who have kind of had those same influences and inspirations and wanted to make very similar kinds of arts but yeah I, meg if you want to do it yeah i had um like a similar experience where it was i was super into uh like the old um spider-man and batman tv shows like the where the animation was like it was great, but it was still a little bit jilted. And then all of a sudden you'd see anime, which was um, like, it felt more grown up as a child. Like, cause like they, it wasn't um, talked down to you in any way. And it was also a little bit, um, it felt, cause it wasn't super mainstream here at the time. So it felt very much different. Like, oh, this is the thing that I have that no one else knows about. And then all of a sudden you find out that everyone knows about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I definitely think I used to po try to pause the TV, like not pause the TV. I used to like pause the old VHSs to get, try to find the impact frame so I could paint it. Cause I was like, I just want to know what that looks like. But then, like you said, it just never translated into a still, <laughs> it didn't have the impact. It wasn't an impact frame anymore. It was just a painting. And mm. um, I definitely had a very similar experience. Yeah. I, I think, I that, think might be a, that might be worth drilling down into. So uh, Meg, for, for those in our audience who aren't familiar with the term, what is an impact frame? <laughs> That's a good point. Um, impact frame is when it's, there's like a, a fast <laughs> movement or um, something is being hit or it's a, there's a few instances where you can use it. But, um, and there's a few different ways you can do it. A, a very common one is it cutting to flashing black and whites where it'll show, it can show outlines of the drawing or um, random details that it makes it feel more impactful. <laughs> uh, how else would you describe that, Chris? I'm not exactly sure how to physically describe that. <laughs> I don't know. I was glad Mike asked you and not me because that's how that's <laughs> hard. <laughs> that. <laughs> Explain. Um, yeah, Google that. It'll, yeah, yeah we'll I feel that. like I feel like it's not it's sort of thing to explain it. It's sort of thing that I think a lot of people look for, unless you're an animation nerd. Um, like looking up the there's really great ones from One Piece right now of um, really interesting impact frames because it's normally one, two, or three frames, but now it's um, they're stretching these really intense drawings over twenty frames where they use actual physical mediums like charcoals and um, pastels to create a different visual medium that makes it stand out and feel different from what you're already watching. Yeah. I always find it really fascinating things like impact frames or smear frames and dry brushing multiples. Uh, Cause those are the sorts of things that um, if you're just watching it, you might not notice it, but it really impacts like the feel of what you're watching. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's the, the best way to put it is that you're not, you're supposed to notice it, but at the same time, you're not. It's supposed to just carry the story more than like confuse you. Like I feel like a lot of if you paused it, you'd be like, "What am I looking at?" But it does carry um, the storytelling throughout. Mm. Debbie, I wanted to ask you. Uh, so, Flying Bark Productions has provided animation services for projects like Marvel's Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, Lego Monkey Kid, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. In your view, what are the common threads between those productions? Um, well, um, I think um, Christian might be able to answer that one better in terms of the common thread, which I guess is, uh, you know, the sort of the impactful 2D, traditional 2D animation style that, you know, our in-house style is threaded through all of those. Wouldn't you agree, Christian? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we've talked about a bunch about style and, and that, yeah, obviously we're, we're very passionate about kind of making these these uh, really challenging, laborious 2D hand-drawn animations. Like people just want to draw here. Um, but I think that the thing that also connects a lot of them that's really important to us when we're looking for projects is um, I, I think the story and the characters and stuff is, is obviously a really big thing. Um, the team here are, are amongst the biggest fans of all the shows that we worked on, I think, and you know, we'll um, draw fan art and stuff of, of the characters for fun and, and people are so people get so excited to watch like new storyboards or read new scripts and stuff because just even as fans we want to see what happens next to these characters and stuff so I think that's a, a really big important draw there I, I think the the heart and and everything in there um, and even if you know even when the story gets quite silly and over the top 
and crazy as, as long as we care about the characters in house i would just know that the team's going to do something um uh really powerful with with everything that we that we create so yeah and meg from your point of view what are the sort of common threads between the productions the flying bark uh focuses on um i've had the um special ability to only be on um just a few projects unfortunately i wish i was i wish i'd been here for longer i've only been here for a few years um but the ones that i have been on um i feel like our dedication for hand-drawn 2d work is what brings us all together like i i feel that's what we're all passionate in and that's what makes makes our work come out and stand out above everyone else <laughs> is that is that we're so passionate um and so there are the common threads <laughs> I think one thing that we've seen in the industry is that over the past, I want to say seven years or so, we've seen that there is a big appetite for 2D action comedy series. Um, that beforehand you didn't see as many of those, at least not targeting the same audiences. Um, what do you think really works with uh, 2D action comedy in, in a hand-drawn animation sort of uh, aspect? Um, I think, I mean, I, again, I think it's just that, uh, kind of that looseness as well, like action comedy, I, to kind of hit those spectrums, you, you need something that, um, can be quite loose, I think, so that, so that you can kind of hit stragglingly both kind of like tones, um, sometimes really frantically back to back, depending on some of our projects. Um, so I think that there's just kind of capturing that frenetic energy. I, I think when you tie it down to really um, consistent rigs or you're having to think about what, kind of what a, a camera can literally do as well and some other mediums, um, it can kind of put, it can kind of act almost as like a little bit of a hindrance for that free flying crazy kind of um, trigger feeling that, that we really like to inject into these projects. Um, I feel like the, I feel like live action. Um, they they have um, it, like both live action and animation has an easy time at hitting the comedy aspect of uh, like um, adventure um, comedy action. But whereas I feel like two D is always almost always able to hit the mark on um, action comedy on like physical gags and stuff like that. Whereas I feel like that can be a lot harder to achieve if you don't have the right director or setup in live action. Um, that I feel like we're uniquely positioned to be able to um, hit those marks easier. Yeah, yeah, um, and it you know it's it's not without its challenges. I think it's um, I've heard a lot of people say this as well, but it's it's like the hardest show you can kind of produce as well because I, I think when you go like a, a strictly kind of action cartoon or it's a little more serious or something, you get your downtime from. Um, the, the kind of the, the talking beats or something. Everyone knows those animes where it's the, the most amazing action sequence you've ever seen um, for two minutes and then the other 18 minutes is is just talking heads. And, and everyone's saying, I think that on the inverse as well, when you've got these really high energy, funny comedy shows, but the style's very simple and loose and, and the you know, cameras are, are pretty simple the whole way through and and action comedy is just kind of doing the hardest parts of both um <laughs> all the time so um it's it, you know, i think we're again super lucky um meg and i and the team to be around right now when there's a little bit of a boon to it but um even again that kind of has its, its ebbs and flows i think like on any given year we might have like a ton of different streamers and, and broadcasters and stuff will come to us looking for action comedy and then every other year it's it's like the radio silence uh, on that end it's it's like yeah very um kind of a very simple comedy show or or something very like dry kind of serious and and nobody's really willing to kind of um shell out the, the time and money it takes to make a, a big action comedy show which is just uh so challenging and expensive all right, Debbie, I've got I have a question for you. Um, what is the workplace culture of Flying Bark Productions like? And while Flying Bark, have you learned anything about working and collaborating with artists? Oh, muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was coughing at this, so I muted. Um, 
culture wise, you know, we try and strive for, a, um, you know, a lot of, um, we try and socialize as much as we can within the role because, you know, quite frankly, sitting, drawing by yourself for eight hours a day can be quite laborious at times, especially if it's something you're not particularly interested in, which I'm sure the animators ebb and flow with shots they really like and other shots that are just, you know, work. So, uh, you know, we try and sort of uh, ensure that there is a lots of things for our artists to do outside of that. Um, you know, we have quite a large in-studio presence, but we also offer hybrid, uh, which assists a lot because Sydney is quite a, a, a big city um, and, you know, it helps people not have to commute so fast, uh, like every day. And then we also, um, you know, have quite a lot of crew who are, are fully remote as well. So, you know, to, to get the talent, we need to be open to all sorts of working environments for the crew. Um, so to, you know, to make sure that all of that, you know, we, we harmonize as much as possible, we try and include all our remote crew and as much as we can uh, in activities and, you know, online forums and chats, etc. And then we also, you know, culture wise, you know, we always strive to be quite very inclusive. And uh, on top of that, um, my personal um, um, mantra is to try and you know um, ensure that the crew are achieving the their tasks within the, the normal 40 hour week and um, you know if, if people aren't finishing what they need to do we, we look at ways to improve that um, you know via extra training extra sort of mentoring or uh, extending deadlines as well I think that's really cool because that's a way that you can retain talent yeah for sure I mean like you know we we, we want to do the best work we can and the only way we can do that is ensuring that the crew are happy and working the best way they can as well. Christian, from your point of view, what is the workplace culture of Flying Bar Productions like and have you learned anything about working and collaborating with artists at your time at the studio? Yeah, um, it's it's great. Like I, I was talking about before, but a lot of like-minded people there i think we're all kind of drawn in by the same passions and the same goals so it makes it really uh makes it some really quick and easy bonding i think pe between people um the the teams really are groups of friends at the end of the day and, and we'll go out and you know flying box really great at you know doing stuff like end of month drinks and rap parties and celebrating the show and the team and the artists um that i know the guys just after work as well will just go and hang out and watch stuff together like you know i think every time there's some new uh like boy in the heron or something comes out everybody's going out in little teams to watch it and stuff like that which is is awesome um and everybody at lunch is is sharing their favorite kind of shows and what to work on and um they're also uh what i've seen a lot is the teams are inspired by each other as well which is great uh there's a, a healthy level of competition i think in the team too we use um uh shop grid to kind of manage all our work and stuff so when people go and put up their work for the day it's there it's like public for the team and so everybody sees what someone's done and is like well i'm gonna do better than them on the next round <laughs> um which is is good i think i think it helps everybody kind of learn from each other as well just by by watching and stuff and then at the, the same time i think everybody as well as uh you know if, if somebody puts a, a question into a team chat or or they ask around the desk behind them as well everybody wants to help everybody else as well it's it's um it's really great it's it's a very collaborative environment i think and Meg, from your point of view, what is the workplace culture of Flying Bar Productions like, and have you learned anything about working and collaborating with artists while at the studio? Um, yeah, well, as Christian said, I feel like the healthy amount of competition is very good. <laughs> I think um, getting the opportunity to have a look at work from, um, people that work um, completely remotely is um, really exciting and fun too. Like, there's a few um, choice members that have joined our team where um a friend of mine at work will be like oh my god did you hear that so and so is joined i've been following him on twitter for years <laughs> i super love his work and it's so it's so great to be able to pick his brain or pick like pick whoever's brain um has joined us and um i feel like as much as we see each other within studio our online culture is also really great um, the people who work remote are as involved in the conversations that we have at work um, and helping each other at work as well. Um, I feel as though Flying Bark really encourages 
asking for help as well. Like if I'm ever struggling on a specific pose or anything, um, I don't feel worried about posting it to a giant group chat and be like, what am I doing wrong? What's, why does this look weird? I need help. <laughs> and um, I'll get sent about four or five um, drawings being like, this is how I think this can be improved or this is what I think is great. And um, it's really encouraging that it doesn't feel like I don't, it's like, oh, don't tell me what to do, but it's like, oh, thank you. I, I really appreciate this. <laughs> I noticed that we've got a couple of questions in the chat about um, applying and about portfolios and demo reels. Uh, so I wanted to ask, um, keeping in mind that like Flying Bar Productions does action comedy series, uh, which is, is kind of interesting because when you're working on or applying for like a comedy series, a lot of the time they'll ask to see things that have like exaggeration and uh, especially focusing on like faces and when you're looking at things that are more focused on action, you're looking at things that are more like anatomical uh, drawings. Can you draw a figure in perspective? Um, those sorts of skills. Uh, so, uh, Mega, someone who has recently, more recently hired for at, at Flying Bark Productions, what would your advice be for someone applying uh, with a demo reel? I always suggest showing off your personality within your reel. I think it's very important to show that you're passionate about what you do and you're not just putting things in to reach a time limit or to, to reach a certain point, like a certain minute on your reel. I think it's very important to, to show off yourself, um, put your best foot forward and um, Make make sure that you're um, that it's entertaining throughout. Otherwise, I feel like some people will get a minute in and be like, "Okay, next person." Like, so I feel like you know, put your best foot forward, keep it going, make us reach the end of the video. Debbie, <laughs> do you have advice for artists uh, yeah. interested in uh, sending a portfolio to studio like Flying Bark? I think uh, myself and Christian were at the roots of uh, all of this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, obviously I probably looked through thousands of reels uh, in my time, uh, especially in the early days. Uh, I now have other people to do that, but basically uh, a non, uh, so a recruitment or a producer or even, you know, sort of what a production might look through the reel first. And we do concentrate on the reel or uh, also uh, still images. So we're not, uh, we have, you know, we have hired people who can only draw and don't know how to animate because uh, Christian will uh, dive into that, I'm sure, because he was the one that told me that. Um, and basically for reels, though, uh, really simply, and I know this sounds really too simple, but you would be surprised at how many people send a reel and a link doesn't work or it loads up so slowly that we're just like, I don't think this is gonna play. Um, also just making sure it's one reel. I've been sent a folder full of files and when you're looking through hundreds of applications and you know, not to discourage people, but like we do look through a lot, but just having your work in a really easy way to watch, knowing that the, uh, people are time poor, um, you know, it's gonna really already set you up to show your best work easily and also just put your best work at the front so that we're not waiting for what we're looking for what you feel is your best work or applicable to applying to us it's always going to be appreciated to be at the front of your reel so that we can kind of do that initial tick off of, of can you know can they draw or animate <laughs> and that's pretty much all like the first pass is looking for because then it's over to the supervisors to do the sort of the the next round so, yeah, yeah, I think it's also important too for, for applicants to realize that uh, studios tend to get a lot of submissions. Would, would that be fair to say for Flying Bark? Yeah, for sure. But uh, just to be encouraging for everyone, a, a lot of people misunderstand the job description too. So although we do get a lot, if you if your work is within the zone of what we do, we will be very interested. Um, mm. But, um, you know, we've had graphic design artists send work and things like that that would be an immediate sort of not suitable. Um, and so we're just looking for drawing skills mainly, and then secondly for any animation skills. And, and you're looking for uh, reels that show as quickly as possible uh, a positive I think it's impression. Just a, it would be just appreciated. Before. I think if we have a hint that that person can do it, we will 
uh, obviously persevere and we're not going to just discard someone, but it, like it, it just delays the process a lot. If your reel doesn't work, we will go back to you and say, we can't play it. Can you please send a new link or password protection is fine, but make sure that that's included in the application. Right, but because uh, the reality is there's a human being who's looking through the, uh, the, the applications and uh, they, have, they have a pretty busy job. Yeah, and it's uh, surprisingly nobody's main job is to look through share reels. So <laughs> we want to do it quickly to get back to what we were doing because, and we, we want to find the best. So we will, you know, try our best to find, to look through everybody as well. Um, Christian, do you have any other advice on um, ascending in the portfolio to a studio like Flying Bark? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, to, to just go off what Meg was saying as well, I think a, a big thing is kind of catering. Um, I mean, Hopefully you're applying to a studio that kind of aligns with the kind of work you want to do and, and your personality and everything. So everything Meg said is, is super valid about kind of showing that off with your work as well, what you're passionate about and a little bit who you are um, in there as well. Um, because of that as well, uh, you know, we always say um, a, a lot of things that, that I've heard universities or, or professors and stuff say not to do, which is like, you know, don't include fan art uh, is, is a big one. Or I've even heard some people just go like, don't include um, music and stuff if you're cutting together a reel. If you put together something that's entertaining and fun and stuff that shows that you know how to uh, put something together at all, which is, is, is definitely something. I, the amount of reels that come through where it's at 1080p and there's gaps and the audio is out of sync and blah, blah, blah. And e even if it's nothing to do with your actual job, you're not going to be an editor, you're, you're going to be animating. Um, it, it still shows that uh, kind of a, a lack of professionalism in that you, you can't put together something cohesive, but also a, a lack of passion as well in that area as well. So it's kind of putting your best foot forward in terms of a format as, as well. And then uh yeah as far as like fan art and stuff as well I, yeah that that's um i think a sticking point for some people but we've hired a, a bunch of people during rise of the team and we hired people who were doing fan art as a team because we're like that's sick that's like the, the capturing the energy or the the posing a few people were drawing it and we're like that looks on model already so <laughs> um and and some of those people even people who've done fan art of, of some of our other shows or just shows that we like that also inspired the shows that we made as well. Like we, we just know that they're passionate as well is, is a really big thing and that they've got a feel for all the, the references and resources. It kind of gives them a shorthand coming into the studio because they already know the vibe of the shows really quickly. Um, yeah, but, uh, and then, yeah, just off the back of, of what Debbie said as well, I think, um, uh, to us, both of them probably, both Meg and Debbie here probably being a little generous and saying like that <laughs> um, people will even get like a minute into a reel if it's not set up successfully. I, I think a lot of people, you know, will will have to look through thousands of reels sometimes when we put out a job application as well. So it's, it's really a thing of figuring that out as soon as possible, even if the first one or two shots kind of definitely aren't there, the, the reel is closed and and the recruiter will look on to the next one as well. So there's a, there's the the advice that everybody's had before, which is put your best work right at the front as well, like maybe bookend with your second or third best shot as well, just to leave a nice taste in, them, in the recruiter's mouth if they make it all the way through. Um, type is better as well. Like it's better to just, you know, if your reel ends up being a, a couple minutes long or a few minutes long because you've got that much work that you're really, really proud of, that's great, but it's, um, uh, quality of quantity as well. I think like about a minute is is pretty good for for a reel. Um, a little lower can sometimes inspire a thought that maybe they don't have enough work to flesh out a full reel. So like at least like a minute is, is good. Um, but don't feel like you have to drag it on and on if, if you're just putting in work that you're like, this isn't my very best work. Um, a lot of people as well cutting together reels, I think will uh, have an aversion to creating new work just for the real as well. Like, especially getting your first few jobs out of university. If you've got like some of your, your shots from like studies and stuff like that, that, that kind of aren't polished or finished or stuff, like just finish them off. That extra work is, is already good training for yourself, but it's going to help secure your job as well. I think sometimes when you see show reels that are, are purely like studies and, and unfinished work from universities and stuff as well it can kind of show as well that maybe you're not you don't have as much of that personal drive and energy to just be creating all the time and that's something that again is really nice about seeing fan art and stuff like that or, or really fleshed out online portfolio is you can see that person is going to be 
creating no matter where they are. And that's, that's a really inspiring person to work with because you're like, if, even if they, they never break into the industry, they're always going to go and create art on their own time, which is, is really cool to see. And the, and the kind of people that's, um, that are really attractive to, to us at Flying Buck as well. Christian, what do you hope to see more of from the industry over the next 30 years? Uh, what I hope to see more of, and this is bias because um, it's the kind of work that we create as well, but <laughs> I just want to see more um, traditional 2D frame by frame animation. I think I want to see more experimental stuff for sure as well and, and kind of risk taking um, in, in the Western world as well, more creating like brand new shows and experimenting with style. Um, I also want to see stuff that skews a bit older as well. Um, I think a lot of our work is kind of um, uh, around the young, young adult um, area, I think, which is, is a really nice mark for us. But I think, you know, we, we uh, and we love that creating art around that um, demographic. But at the same time, I, I think I would love to see just more um, adult animation that isn't just like adult comedies and stuff as well, like adult dramas and, and adult action comedy and stuff that's um just takes advantages of of all the strengths of animation i feel like a lot of adult comedies are just uh i mean everyone knows the reputation but it's it's a very very simplistic style wise and it, and it's about um swearing um and i think we're, we're seeing a lot more um genuinely experimental and interesting and thought-provoking um adult animations i think coming out over the the last few years i think like carol in the world and um mm. And, and stuff is, is like uh, no, I think that's a really really great example to be honest. And um, and dang, what's that new? It's like a new HBO one, Scavengers Rain and stuff like that. I, I think mm. I'd, I'd love to see some more stuff like that. And then naturally as well, I think we just want to see more films as well. Um, I think there's just not many 2D animated films happening right now in, in the West, which naturally I would love to see and also um, work on as well. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, right? Because there are 2D animated films being made in like France and throughout like Europe. You'll see things like Mars Express, um, and it's it's interesting, right? Because there does seem to be an appetite for it. Yeah. Uh, or I watched uh, was it Unicorn Wars last year or two years ago? Unicorn Worlds, uh, I think. Unicorn Worlds. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Meg, what do you hope to see more of from the animation industry over the next 30 years? Pretty much exactly what Chris said, but I also, I, as much as I love bite-sized media, like taking episodes at a time, I do love um, full-length 2D film um, that I feel is pretty rare, um, rare in the Western world. Um, I would, because I, I feel like a lot more... Um, time and energy is put into full-length feature films um, a lot more of the time. So I'm excited to see that. And as Chris said, I work on them as well. <laughs> and Debbie, what do you hope to see more from the animation industry over the next 30 years? I think reflecting on what Christian said, really, we, we are very aligned in what we want to <laughs> see. But um, yeah, basically it's the risk taking really, because, you know, um, the the model sort of the finance model for a lot of the shows that are funded tend to they need to rely on a an established fan base because they know that they'll get the return uh you know traditional 2d animation is quite expensive and it's not something that can be risked on easily so just the risk taking but you know we we've talked amongst ourselves and we do uh, sort of develop our own ip and we have to think about ways of, you know, keeping the cost low to make it more attractive, so that someone will take a, a chance on on a an original IP. Um, but yeah, that's something we'd love to see more of is, you know, the appreciation for the craft through the financing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think we're just hoping every time something like Summit of the Gods or something comes out, we, we're always just hoping that it's this. Um, you know, it's, they're always critically like very like successful and stuff. But I think we're always hoping that they're these big runaway successes as well. So it just gives us more things to point to, to go like, again, like you bet like there, yeah. there's that appetite is there and, and people want to see that work, but it's, um, it's just not always at the forefront. I think of the cultural zeitgeist, um, there's music, movies coming out and a lot of it can be a little bit more niche, but, um, we're hoping that there's just a continued trend to, to it being more and more, um, popular and mainstream over the, the next few years.
He, he wants something to point to to say, hey, do you want more of those? Yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, and that's how things get made, to be honest, as well. Like, I think, um, you know, I, again, super lucky for that experience we had on Rising Team and T at the start because, uh, when we've taken all the work from um, broadcasters and streamers and stuff since then, a lot of it was pointing to that show and going, look, this is great and people love this show. Um, and let, let's do that for this franchise or this this brand new IP or whatever it was as well. Um, so I think just having, yeah, more of that is, is helpful for everybody who wants to produce that kind of work. Yeah, I think Ninja Turtles is really fascinating as just like a franchise because it's like shape-shifted so much throughout its history. Like the very first comics were this like ultra-violent uh, parodies of like Daredevil. And then it turned into like a kid's series of like lots of merch. And uh, you, you just see like this like really fascinating shape-shifting that it goes through. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a weird one. It's, su it's super fun as well, but I, there's, there's this weird kind of... um life cycle that they now go through and i when we um did rise we, we were talking to um andy syrian and Ant Ward of the creators but Ant had worked on the 2012 series which was 3d and at the time when the when they first released the designs and started releasing the episodes of the show and stuff there was um there's a lot of people very excited about it but there's a lot of backlash from turtles fans as well because it was new and he kind of explained to us that it was, they, they went to the exact same thing on the 2012 one where it was like, you get hit at the start, everybody's like, not my turtles, um, <laughs> to go, go back to a season X of the last one, blah, blah, blah. And then over time, this new iteration, because uh, it's fresh and new and different and stuff over time, it, it wins all these people over and it's more exciting. And then the next one starts and all of a sudden everybody loves the version everyone hated at the start <laughs> and and they're like hey do it now do it season x of rise or whatever um instead, instead of the new one so i think i think that's probably just going to be the a perpetual cycle forever for turtles to be honest <laughs> is um yeah. uh, i think but i think the reinvention is you kind of have to break expectations too yeah yeah i think it's also i mean it keeps it super fresh as well like that that reinvention is yeah i think is is such a strength to it and the reason i mean it's such a weird franchise at all i think uh -huh. to have survived and to almost always be like at the forefront of of um mainstream culture almost right turtles it's such a weird one because it's the i mean even the name but the teenage mutant ninja turtles <laughs> concept is is so bizarre um yeah but it's yeah it's uh, awesome. i'm fascinated by it so my very last question um debbie where can our audience go to learn more about flying bar productions and apply for jobs at your studio Oh, just our website, <laughs> I think, is the main spot. Uh, so it's uh, flyingbark.com.au. I'm sure you can have a link to it somewhere in your All right, amazing. Um, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Christian, Megan, Debbie, for joining us for today's live stream. And thank you to our Thanks. audience for joining in to ask more questions. Uh, we'll be inviting more studios to discuss their work on the last Thursday of each month. And you won't want to miss it. So be sure to tune in next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Cool. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.